Welcome to the ammonia and refrigerants lecture. Now, refrigerants might sound boring, but when you lump it in with ammonia, you get everyone's attention because we have had guys go to the hospital for being exposed to ammonia. We've had quite a few ammonia calls as a department. We've also had other kinds of refrigerant type of calls. So we're going to do three things this morning. We're going to talk about refrigeration very, very quickly. We're going to talk about the four major classes of refrigerants and the hazards of each. And then we're going to talk a little bit about responding to specific emergencies with an emphasis on ammonia. So the main idea of a refrigeration system is not that it emits cool, but it moves heat, right? So at some point, you're going to have a container of liquid that's going to be bubbling off or boiling. What happens to a cylinder of propane, a barbecue tank, is you open it and you start cooking your hamburgers, the hamburgers get hot, but the propane tank gets cold. You get ice forming on that propane tank. Why? That's because as this liquid bubbles, as it boils, if you could cut open a propane tank, cut it in half, look at it, it would look like water, it'd be boiling, it has to actually absorb heat to make it boil. It requires heat. Now that heat might be room temperature heat because propane's got a very, very low uh, boiling point, but it's absorbing heat and it emits gas. Goes over to a second container, and this is a vast simplification, of course, where the gas turns into liquids. Right? It precipitates out, precipitates the wrong word, condenses out, and reforms liquid. So what happens when you force a whole bunch of gas into a small container, either to turn it into a liquid or just a pressurized cylinder, it gets hot. Right? You know this, filling a Scott cylinder, if you pressurize a Scott cylinder, it gets hot. As you force gas into here, it starts emitting heat. Now at some point, you gotta get the liquid back here. So you got vapor, and you got liquid. If this was an AC unit in the summertime, this would be inside your house, that would be outside your house, right? This would be absorbing the heat, carrying it out here, and then outside your heat, you've got the fan unit where it's emitting the heat. Like I said, a vast oversimplification, but that's about all the science that we need. The big takeaway here is that if you have some kind of refrigeration unit, doesn't matter if it's carbon dioxide, doesn't matter if it's ammonia, doesn't matter if it's some kind of freon, you're going to have a vapor line and a liquid line in there somewhere. And the differences between having a leak in the vapor line and having a leak in the liquid line are huge. One is going to be producing some vapor, the other is going to be producing a crap ton of vapor because the liquid is going to emerge, expand, and create that much more vapor. So those are the basic overview of refrigeration. I apologize to anyone who is actually a refrigeration mechanic. It's a simplified version. Now we're going to do the four classes of refrigerants real quick. Now here's how I think it's useful to think about refrigerants, classifying them into sort of four categories. Number one, we'll call it freons. That's not quite correct, but I'll talk about why. Number two, ammonia. We have a lot of this in delta. Number three, propane sometimes butane, and then four other. So other is obviously a big catch-all into which we get all kinds of exotic gases, all kinds of dangerous gases. Let's go through these four quickly, starting with freons. Freons. Technically, that's not the correct name, but I'm going to be calling them freons, and most people in the industry call them freons. Freons is a brand name. What they actually are is a subset of halogenated hydrocarbons, halogenated hydrocarbons. And this is about as much science as we're going to do. Halogenated means it's got a halogen in it. Halogen is a group of chemicals like fluorine, fluorine, chlorine, iodine, etc. Bromine, other ones. They're all really reactive chemicals. There's a reason that patriotic Germans defending their homeland against British oppression were using things like chlorine to delay and uh, try to defend themselves against the dastardly English. Super poisons. Hydrocarbon. A hydrocarbon is a hydrogen and a carbon. It's a whole different lecture on this, but basically we've got some kind of hydrocarbon chain. 
with hydrogens. Lots of hydrogens. So a halogenated hydrocarbon, an example would be, instead of a hydrogen here, we would have a chlorine attached to that carbon. Basically, you take a carbon chain and you chlorinate. Now, halogenated hydrocarbons are a very large group. Some of them are crazy poisonous. Some of them are used as fumigants. Some of them are used as dry cleaning fluid. The ones that are used for refrigeration, freons, are very stable. They're generally not poisonous. They're generally not flammable. And their main hazard is oxygen displacement. We have a giant freon tank in here. We open it up. We'd all start feeling headachey. We'd start feeling nauseous. We'd pass out. We would die. That would be from oxygen displacement. That's usually the biggest hazard. But there are hundreds of freons. Many, many, many freons. Now, every freon out there will have an R number. This isn't an insulation value. This is an identifier for what that chemical is. So if we go to a call and the refrigeration tech goes, yeah, we had a great big leak of HCFC-141B. This doesn't mean anything to us until we look it up. But to somebody who lives and breathes this stuff, they'd be able to take a look at that and figure out what that exact chemical is. We can look it up. We can find the MSDS for HCFC-141B. And that'll tell us how flammable it is, whether it's heavier than air or lighter than air, hint, Freons are heavier than air. Tells how poisonous it is. Tells what environmental effects there are. Tells how much of an ozone depletion uh, it is. Because one big problem with freons is they are super greenhouse gases. The effect of one atom, or one molecule rather, of freons circulating in the atmosphere is much, much, much more than a similar molecule of carbon dioxide. It's also major ozone depletion chemicals, right? They go up the, into uh, the upper atmosphere and they eat the ozone. So that's bad. So they're trying to phase them out, um, but they are necessary for some applications. I said that they're generally stable, generally not flammable, generally not poisonous. But say we had some hydrocarbon. We got carbon, 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 carbon. We've got a fluorine here, We've got a chlorine here another chlorine here. Let's take it that this isn't poisonous. But now we heat this up. It gets in a big fire. It gets super hot temperature. At that point, this could start breaking apart. And the chlorines and the fluorines could start releasing. You have chlorine gas, totally poisonous. Fluorine gas, totally poisonous. You make things like phosgene, again, totally poisonous. So if these are, although they're not flammable, if they get exposed to high levels of heat, then they can release super toxic stuff. That's something to keep in mind. If you have a fire refrigeration plant, it's probably way more poisonous than a regular fire. Freons, what we just covered, big group of chemicals, one name. Ammonia, one name, one chemical. This is just one thing, but it's so common that we're putting it in its own category. Ammonia, NH3, means one nitrogen surrounded by three hydrogen, NH3. So ammonia is used in place, just about every ice rink, so Tilbury ice, Sun God, Planet ice. It's used in refrigeration places. It's used in fish processing places. We had a call at the cakery. That's a smaller scale food preparation place. It's used all over the place. If you're going to any kind of facility where they've got large walk-in freezers, kind of an industrial setting, my default assumption would be that it's going to be ammonia and I'm probably not going to be wrong. There's probably some other system out there that uses some other uh, refrigerant gas, but most of the time it's going to be ammonia. You can have a jug of ammonia liquid. This is not the household spray ammonia that you have. That's ammonia gas dissolved in water. We're talking about pure ammonia, like 100% ammonia in a, in a vat, say like a propane sized cylinder, shake it around, if you could open it up without releasing it all, there would be something in there that looked kind of like water. And then the top of it would be vapor. Again, so we've got that vapor to liquid, liquid to vapor transition. That's what allows it to be such a good refrigerant. The NFPA 704, symbol for ammonia, gives it a three for health, which means pretty damn poisonous. 
and a 1 for flammability. Now you might go and look at that going, ah, it's just a 1. How flammable is that really? And the answer is, out in the open, not very flammable. If you had a big ammonia release outside and you run through it with a flare or with a blowtorch or an Elon Musk flamethrower, you're probably not going to light it on fire. Probably. But if you combine it, say in a compressor room of a building, and you get ammonia building up, 16 to 25 percent, that's your LEL, that's your UEL, and you spark it, it can blow up catastrophically. In fact, I think the only two guys who've ever died in an ACE suit died making entry into an ammonia facility. Lots of people have died from hazmat, but once everything slowed down and they put on ACE suits and they go in, only what? Of those two guys, one of them died and one was severely injured because it flashed. Now, this is the UEL and the LEL. You've got to keep in mind that in an average compressor room, there can be compressors. Those compressors are going to have tons of oil in them. So now we've got a leak, we've got high pressure ammonia vapor coming out, shh, it's going to be entraining some of that oil. And instead of just having ammonia in that room, you're also going to have an oil mist. So now, an oil mist, not probably a good thing. <laughs> can make it more flammable, so you can actually get explosion outside of this range because you've changed the mixture from pure ammonia to an ammonia oil mist uh, mixture. So keep that in mind. Basically at higher levels, especially contained, can definitely be flammable. Very, very poisonous. It loves water. Ammonia loves water, meaning it goes straight for your lungs, goes straight for your eyes. If you took a body and you left it in an ammonia plant that had blown up for a while, pulled it out 20 minutes later, it would look like a raisin because all the water would have been pulled out of the body. So very, very, very hydrophilic. It loves water and it'll pull it out of everywhere. Now, we can use this to our advantage. You've probably heard of using a fog spray to knock down an ammonia leak. Say we had an ammonia leak here and I opened a fog spray, so there's a ton of water, especially fine mist water. The ammonia is going to mix with it and fall out of the sky, mostly. Is it a 100% solution? No. Does it create another problem, the runoff of super basic water, as opposed to acidic, it's acidic and basic? Yes, you've now got to contain that runoff, but it may be better than having that gas drift across a residential neighborhood behind Sun God City. So you can use that water uh, to your advantage. Of course, it also means that on a foggy, foggy day, or a rainy day, that ammonia is going to be hanging around at ground level a lot more. Say we had an ammonia release at the top of a building here, at a refrigeration facility. This isn't as far-fetched as it sounds. Towards the end when we're talking about actual emergency, we're going to be talking about the potential of releasing ammonia from the top of a building. Ammonia is lighter than air, but it doesn't go up right away. When it comes out, it's super cold. Super cold meaning it's condensed, meaning the vapors are going to go down first, then they're going to roll along the ground, and then eventually as they warm up, they're going to go up. If it's very, very moist, if there's a lot of fog, it's going to stick closer to the ground for longer and you know, we might have a plume extend that way. The thing to understand is just because it's lighter than air, just because you did your big three and you figured out the vapor density is less than one, doesn't necessarily mean that when it comes out that it's going to go up. Another thing to consider is that it's really cold when it comes out of the average refrigeration system. If it's a liquid leak, as it goes out into the air and expands, it's absorbing a ton of heat. It might be absorbing a ton of heat on your skin. I've been burned by propane, I'm jetting out of a propane tank, super cold, minus 30, minus 40, something like that. And it feels almost like you were touching a flame. You get a cold burn instead of a hot burn. Don't underestimate these things. There's a reason that we've got cryo aprons and cryo gloves for dealing with these sorts of things. They're not, ammonia doesn't fit the exact definition of a cryogenic substance, but bloody cold enough to give you a major burn should count for something, and of course poisonous. So just keep in mind that it's going to behave over time. Uh, you know, the vapor density effectively changes over time. When it comes out, typically it's going to be cold and go down, and then only slowly go up. Propane, and to a lesser extent, butane. This might seem kind of strange because we think of propane and butane as things that generate heat barbecues, lighters, that sort of thing. But because they can go from liquid to vapor and vapor to liquid very effectively, and sort of with pressures that can be generated uh, commercially and residentially, 
it's a very useful refrigerant. You're seeing them more and more, especially as they're starting to phase out Freon. So many of the replacement cartridges for your car AC used to be a Freon. Now it's going to be butane or, butane or propane or a mix of the two, you know, formulated to be correct for your car. Both of these are odorless, invisible, and if you condense them into a liquid, they look like water. So there's nothing really to tip you off. In refrigeration systems, as far as I know, it's mostly unodorized, meaning if you have a leak, you're not going to smell it. If you've got oxygen displacement problems, obviously you've got flash hazards. They're a little bit poisonous in terms of oxygen displacement, but the big danger is it blows up and makes a big fire. So what are you using to detect this? Your first line of defense is your LEL meter on your four gas. That's the main way that you can detect this. Hazmat's got some other tools to look for propane and butane. So you're going to start with your LEL meter. Incidentally, if you've got a kitchen and you've got a fridge here and it's using propane as a refrigerant, they have to make sure that the quantity of propane in that fridge, if it were all to release, is not going to create more than a 20% LEL environment in there. So it's not like there's a giant amount of propane in there. It's not like if it leaks out, the whole house is potentially an explosive environment. But, you know, that's the regulation. Who knows how large the kitchen is that they actually put it into? Who knows how many fridges are compromised? Uh, there also can't be any sparking sources in that fridge, but who knows what they've replaced the, uh, the light bulbs with in there. You know, we're going to an emergency, which means that things are no longer the way that they were supposed to be. This is also a very common refrigerant in uh, pop dispensers, you know, Gatorade coolers, Coca coolers, Sprite coolers, that sort of thing. That's where you're going to see it the most. Four, other refrigerants. So there are many, many, many refrigerants. There's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different kinds of refrigerants. Some are Freons, like we talked about. Sometimes they use ammonia. Sometimes they use a butane propane mixture. And then they use just about everything else. Some ones that we might run into, SO2, sulfur dioxide. Very poisonous, but a great refrigerant. So they used to use this in the old days. I think Surrey had a call with an old refrigerator that was leaking SO2 and they couldn't figure out what it was for quite a while. Also, CO2, carbon dioxide. But that's a very high pressure system, so you need very high pressure pipes for some specialized applications. You might run into CO2 being used as a refrigerant. And then a whole list of other things. So if you go to a call and you find out that it's you know a refrigerant, don't make any assumptions. You've got to try and find out what it is and it can be a whole host of other things. Let's talk a little bit about responding to refrigerant emergencies. Every situation is different. There's so many chemicals involved. There's so many things that can go wrong in a refrigeration system. I can't give you a one size fits all solution, but there are certain things you're gonna keep in mind. Toxicity. Is this stuff toxic on its own? Oxygen displacement. Is this stuff gonna push all the oxygen out of the room, make everyone stupid, then make everyone sick, then make everyone dead? Uh, is this involved in a fire? That's a really big deal. We talked about flammability of freons, which very, very low, but releases poison stuff. Flammability of ammonia, flammable, potentially deadly, deadly, potentially explosive. And then there are other hazards as well, like a cryogenic hazard. So you gotta keep those things in mind. For whatever refrigerant it is, you wanna identify it. If you go to a refrigeration facility and they've got a leak, your first question is, what are you using as your refrigerant? They tell you it's R123ABC. You go, you get your MSDS for R123ABC. You immediately know that that's a Freon. Uh, and you look it up, and the first thing you go is the big three. You need the vapor pressure. Almost certainly, it'll be higher than atmospheric. It'll be higher than 760 millimeters of mercury because it wants to expand into a vapor. You need the vapor density. Freons, heavier than air, ammonia, lighter than air, but you might not remember this in the field. <laughs> You're gonna remember the big three. Look it up again, just confirm. Remember also that if it's lighter than air and it comes out initially, it's gonna be heavier than air before going up. Then you're gonna get your NFPA 704 diagram. Big difference between dealing with this and dealing with this, isn't there? 
This might be your typical Freon, possibly. Look it up. Individual results may vary. This would be ammonia. Right? One's flammable, one's not. One's poisonous in its own, the other is mostly oxygen displacement. You want those three things, vapor density, vapor pressure, and FPA 704, then you can start building your plan. The next thing you want to know is big or small. Is this a small little leak? Is someone smelling something in the back corner of freezer three? Or did, did they come out and they say, man, the, the forklift driver ran into the pipe and the pipe just burst and this liquid came out and the forklift driver's in there somewhere and uh, we haven't been able to call him on his cell. We think he's dead. One's a small leak, one's a big leak. In general, small leaks tend to be vapor leaks. Big leaks tend to be liquid leaks. But of course, <laughs> you could end up with a large vapor leak. You could end up with a small liquid leak. These things are not exclusive. So you got your refrigerant name, you got your big three, what's next? Well now you got to start thinking about the other pieces of the puzzle. Fire hazards. Is there a fire or is this flammable? Is there a fire or is this flammable? As I said before, freons generally aren't flammable. But if you heat them up enough, they evolve super poisonous things. You need to know about that. That's if there's a pre-existing fire. Ammonia is poisonous and it's flammable. If there's also a fire in the building, or if that ammonia refrigeration plant is threatened by a fire, that's a very different situation from just a leak. You're dealing with a potential bomb. You're dealing with a potential you know, catastrophic hazard that people go in there to do some pipe fitting to close the leak off, but the whole thing catches on fire and explodes, they're dead. So, are there fire concerns? What are you gonna use for respiratory protection? SCBA would be a minimum. Because if you're going in there to do some pipe fitting on uh, a Freon, so you've got a Freon, it's not poisonous, not flammable, the guy says, yeah man, the, uh, the valve over there opened up and started pissing out and all you need to do is give that valve a quarter turn. And you go in there, you go in there in your station gear, and you go in there and turn the valve, but that pipe is rotten and the pipe breaks, there is an emergency there or the valve just comes apart. Now you potentially are in an oxygen displacement situation. So you want to be on an SCBA in case there's a catastrophic displacement of oxygen. Depending whether this is flammable or not, whether this is skin toxic or not, ammonia is both, you're going to want to upgrade the level of protection. You've got to be aware that ammonia techs who are working with this stuff all the time are just going in there in coveralls and maybe a respirator. They're actually outside the bounds of what's allowed by WCB. For ammonia, the threshold limit value is 25 parts per million. The IDLH is 300. You're not allowed to be on a respirator in a 300 parts per million environment. Those guys are going in there 500, 700, 1,000, and they're putting up with you know any wet areas of their body beginning to get burned, any cuts on their body beginning to get burned because the ammonia settles out. It loves water, remember? So it settles into that cut, settles into that crotch settles into that armpit and it begins to burn. They're doing it because they want to get the job done and go home. They want to go and hit the bar. So we're typically going to be wearing a higher level of protection than those cowboys who work with it all the time because we don't work with it all the time and also we're much more governed by WorkSafe than they are. The next thing you want to do is think about resolving the leak. What does this mean? It depends. In some cases it might be going and finding the power switch to the plant and turning it off and the power will power down, and the pressure that's behind the leak will begin to go away, and the leak will slow down. That might be all that we're going to do. And then when the refrigeration techs come in from Chilliwack, they can do the fixing. In certain cases, we might do the pipe fitting. We might, oh, see, there's where the pipe ruptured. We're going to crimp it on either side. Might not solve it completely, but it's going to slow it down. We might try taping or puttying or epoxying something. We might take the valve apart, we might turn a valve. There's going to be something to resolve the leak, probably. If we can't do it, that's okay. We're going to make the scene safe, I'm going to wait for the refrigeration techs to show up and work with them. It's going to be difficult not to get entrained in their way of doing it. We're going to make sure that we do it our way, but um, we're going to stay safe. Another thing that we've got to think about is metering. Meters. How? That's the world's worst meters. How are we going to measure this stuff? There are halogenated hydrocarbon pull tubes on the hazmat truck, 
but they're complicated to use. These are ones where you want to go read the instructions, read the instructions again, and then do them while someone is reading the instructions to you a third time. Because it's complicated. It's, you know, bend in the middle here, tip it this way, tip it that way, wait 30 seconds, get a reading. It's not simple. There are pull tubes though that can measure halogenated hydrocarbons, and that might be appropriate for a Freon call. Other things we could be using is uh, we've got a ton of ammonia sensors, ammonia strips, ammonia pull tubes. So if it's an ammonia leak, we've got tons of ways to measure that. Oxygen displacement is another big one, right? A lot of these things displace oxygen. So if we go in there with a standard four gas meter, and we start watching the oxygen go down, then that's a pretty good indication that there's something in the air. Remember that each 1% that the oxygen goes down means that 5% of something else is in the air. So a little shift in that oxygen meter can mean that there's a ton of stuff in the air. But you want to think about meters. How are you going to measure this stuff if you can? Next thing, ventilation. You've got in there, you've uh, wearing your SCBA with your meter, you've gone and fixed the leak with some basic pipe fitting. You're going to ventilate that stuff out of there. You're going to set up fans or say the ice rinks, many refrigeration facilities, they've got a built-in ventilation system. Most ice rinks have got like a louvered set of windows with a fan and if the ammonia, if the ammonia alarm goes on, if it detects ammonia in the room, it fires up the fan and it might even be a two-stage fan that the higher the ammonia goes, the more vigorously it starts jetting the ammonia out of the building, which is great for the building, not so great for the neighborhood. So there the fan is built in. In other places, you might need to provide the fan. That's okay, you carry lots of fans. Also, a lot of these gases are heavier than air. So we got to start thinking about sumps, if it's a poisonous gas. We got to start thinking about low-lying spaces. We don't want to go into a place where the leak was on the second floor, then somebody walks into a room on the first floor and falls unconscious because all the oxygen's been displaced. We don't want something terrible like the new Westminster barge happening inside a building. And it very easily could if there's all that oxygen displacement. So these are some things to think about in coming up with your response plan. Let's take ammonia, since it's such a common hazard. At an ice rink, this is our ice rink, underneath the ice, there are lines with really cold brine, that's salt and water. So if you drive a hole, if you take a drill and you drill down into the ice and you hit one of these pipes, you're not gonna get ammonia coming out, you're gonna get a very, very cold, salty liquid. That's to cool the, uh, the ice. This brine goes back to the ammonia room into a chiller. So the brine gets made cold in the chiller. What makes the chiller cold? Well, that's your whole ammonia system. The ammonia system, through expansion and contraction, through taking heat out of the building or out of the brine and letting it go into the atmosphere, makes the brine cold. So we've got ammonia, we've got brine. So if you have a leak in an ammonia room and liquid's coming out, it's not necessarily ammonia. It might just be brine, if you're lucky. That ammonia, there's all kinds of plumbing in there. There's tons of valves. If you can get the entry link camera or the, the tablet and go in there and show the plant engineer who's safely back in the hazmat truck and say, okay, which valve do you want us to turn? That might be the best way to go. But that ammonia also has a pipe that comes out here. Somewhere there'll be a pipe that goes up, usually above the building, sometimes off to the side a little bit. And there's a red box Almost all places have a red box. It's called the emergency dump valve or the emergency relief valve or the firefighter dump valve. And it's gonna have a valve in it that you can turn. That valve is to release all of the ammonia up through the pipe and out here. So first we'll cover firefighter safety. If you are the firefighter who is doing this, where's that ammonia gonna go? Well, it's coming out, it's super cold. First, it's gonna come down on top of you then it's gonna roll off the building, then it's gonna slowly warm up, and then it's gonna go up. So if you're doing this, be aware that you're bringing down your own doom upon you. More importantly, when would you do this? If you have a leak in the ammonia room, you don't wanna open the system. You don't wanna release all that ammonia all at once, because it's a giant plume. It's better to have a reasonably small leak coming out, 
which has got a chance to dissipate before you hit the highway, before you hit the residential area, before you get it somewhere else. If you release it all at once, you're going to have a giant and very concentrated plume and probably casualties downrange. The reason you would break that, when I've talked to refrigeration people, they pretty much say there's only one reason they could think of to, to release, to break that glass and open that valve, is if the ammonia room were on fire or there was fire impinging on it. If there's fire impinging on the ammonia room and the ammonia room's leaking, or even if it's not, that's an additional source of fuel for the fire. It's a potential bomb if you get to the right concentrations between the LEL and the UEL, and it blows up. You can have a giant bomb sitting beside your building. So it's important to note that this operation, opening that emergency release valve, is like your last ditch, everything else has failed uh, maneuver. You're gonna have to do it in coordination with evacuating people downwind, plume modeling, trying to figure out where that ammonia is gonna go, um, taking precautions that this person doesn't die in an explosion or in a fire. It's a really high risk, high reward uh, maneuver. And certainly some refrigeration places have stopped installing these, figuring that the risk of having it there and having somebody open it maliciously or somebody open it by accident or somebody go, oh, there's a leak in that building. Quick, turn the ammonia valve. It will make the situation infinitely worse. So you don't just turn that valve if there's a leak. You might turn that valve maybe if there's a fire. The other thing that's in those boxes sometimes, if this is the box that's roughly the size of the box, there'd be a valve here that you can use a wrench. Sometimes there's an electrical switch here. It would say on, off. That electrical switch is the power to the compressors in the ammonia room. So if you do have a leak in the ammonia room, you might want to turn that switch off. Maybe. That switch, that electrical switch, is a very different thing than the valve. You're going to power down the compressors so that it's not still continuing to build power and releasing more product at a fast rate. Um, might not always be the right thing to do. I would consult with a refrigeration guy, consult with the emergency contact for the building, but that is an option. Not all buildings have that on-off switch. Almost all of them have the dump valve. Bottom line, we have negotiated several big ammonia calls. They're complicated because you're dealing with potential injuries, you're dealing with different agencies, you're dealing with ambulance, you're dealing with contractors coming in to fix it. It's a municipal building. Anyone with any interest at all is going to show up. The mayor, the CAO, council, different agencies are all going to show up. It's going to be a cluster. It's going to be a ton of people there, a ton of eyes on you. So number one, you're going to stay safe. You're going to use the appropriate level of PPE. If you're working in this compressor room, uh, unless it's a real low level of leak, for sure BA, probably some kind of flash resistant clothing. If uh, Even if the contractors aren't just going in there and coveralls and a breathing apparatus. Remember, you're not allowed to be in an IDLH environment just on a respirator. You know, WorkSafe says so. And then take it slow, right? Like you're going to be dissipating the vapors. There's going to be vapors coming out of here anyway. You're going to have to make a decision as to are you going to try and knock them out of the air with a fog stream. You're going to make a decision. Do we have to evacuate people downwind? Do we need to tape off an area that nobody can blunder through that area? And uh, Get, you get taken down by the toxins and then is it a liquid leak is it a gas leak is it a small leak is it a big leak is there a fire all those things will affect what you're going to do maybe we're going to do the plumbing maybe we're going to go in there and turn off a valve maybe we're going to go in there and crimp a line hopefully you're going to crimp the right line which is where communication with the outside world is super important if the plant engineer if the refrigeration specialist says you know turn the yellow valve you can show them on the uh, on the tablet or worst case scenario on FaceTime say is this the valve you want me to turn are you hundred percent sure it's this valve okay we're gonna turn that valve and shut it down then you're gonna proceed once the leak is stopped you're gonna ventilate you're gonna keep on metering make sure it's safe make sure the levels keep coming down and uh, we will mitigate the ammonia leak the way that we have mitigated other ones in the past all right I hope this is a good guide for the instructors to use in their own teaching uh, you can add to this, you can subtract to this, 
If I missed something, let me know and I'll add it into the paperwork that goes with it. That way when you're delivering this lecture, you can uh, make it your own.